Good morning, my relatives. It's Mark Charles. It is Thursday morning, and I'm sitting here with my second cup of coffee. And I wanted to talk about a few things going on in the news right now. So, uh, yeah, let's get going. Um, but before I begin, I want to do as I always do, which is acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from what's now called Washington, D.C. These are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And I want to honor the Piscataway as the host of these lands. I want to thank the Piscataway for their stewardship of these lands. And I want to just state how humble I am that I'm living on these lands today. I see Steve is on with us. Yat A, Steve. Good morning, Mr. Phil Fox. Thank you for joining. Uh, Corderno, Yat A, Madeline, Yat A. Thank you all for joining this morning. It's good to see you. Um, I was out of town for a few days last week. I was actually up in Wisconsin. Um, I spoke at, uh, I did four events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. On Friday, I did a book tour event at a church in Milwaukee, St. Mark's Church. And then on Saturday, I did a, a Doctrine of Discovery presentation at St. Bartholomew's or St. Bart's Church, Episcopal Church in Powaukee, which is just a little bit outside of Milwaukee. And then Sunday morning, I preached also at that same church in Powaukee at St. Bart's Church. And then on a on uh, Monday, or Sunday afternoon, I traveled to Madison, Wisconsin, and I spoke in Madison uh, at uh, one of the churches there. And um, the good news is uh, that the church where I was in uh, Pewaukee, where I both preached and I did my... Um, my sermon, I, I preached and I did the Doctrine of Discovery sermon, is they recorded both of those videos, or both of those presentations. And so I'm going to share them now in the chat. So if you'd like to uh, see where they are, uh, they're both up on YouTube. This first one is uh, On Selling Truth, the Doctrine of Discovery Forum. It's very similar. This <laughs> One of the things I loved about this presentation is they gave me pretty much a, a no time limit. And so I, I took almost over two hours, about two hours and 10 minutes to go through almost not all, but a lot of my content on the Doctrine of Discovery, including looking at some of the treaties and some analysis I've done lately, as well as uh, looking at white Christian nationalism and things I've done on the book tour. And I did a full over half an hour on Lincoln. And so, yeah, if you're interested in seeing that, um, I highly recommend you go to that YouTube video I just put there. And uh, one of the good things is, is in the description on that YouTube video, they actually have chapters where you can go to uh, specific sections of the video. They also did a good job of, of incorporating my slides with that presentation. And so that's on there. And one of the chapters, again, this is one of the chapters I'm most excited about, is the chapter I did on Abraham Lincoln. And so I, I put the highlight to that right there um, in the YouTube channel. It goes right to the section. It's over half an hour uh, specifically on Lincoln. And then uh, I preached on Acts chapter 10 on Sunday morning at the same church. And this is uh, the YouTube video for that sermon on the radical inclusivity of the Holy Spirit from Acts 10. And that also has chapters in there as well, but I welcome you to look at that. Um, so I was very excited to be able to, to be there. Also, one of the honors of that trip is the church I spoke at in Madison. And here's a few pictures of that church. Let me just show Yeah, so that was exciting about that. Let me go ahead and <laughs> peek my face out from behind there. So, um, so that was a, that was a it was a good weekend. I really enjoyed my time in in Wisconsin. Uh, I enjoyed doing the book tour. I enjoyed preaching, and I really like being able to do those two presentations kind of back to back on the doctrine of discovery and try to try out how to incorporate um, some of my other content, especially around treaties and white Christian nationalism into that presentation. So I really enjoyed doing that. And I'm hoping to get those videos up on my YouTube channel. Right now they're on St. Bart's YouTube channel, but they did uh, send them to me. So I'm hoping to put them up on my YouTube channel and then share them out over my social media later today or later this week. 
Um, but anyway, I wanted to share that with you. If you've been following the news, and let me just see if there's any comments on here that's going on. Um, Nina, you watched me preach there. Wow. Thank you for watching that. I'm glad you're able to, to join that service. Um, my father, um, my father actually was able to watch that live as well. And so that was really good to, that was really good to see him there too. Um, or he joined that live as well online. So that was good to see that. But, um, anyway, what I want to talk about today if you've been following the news, you are well aware that today is the day that the U.S. government hit its debt ceiling. In other words, we no longer have money in the budget, or we no longer have money, our room on the credit card, if you will, to pay the bills that we have already agreed to pay. So here is an article in the AP that is looking into uh, just talking about the debt ceiling. And so we've reached the debt ceiling today. And uh, Secretary Yellen has stated that she can now do some extraordinary maneuvering, is what it's called, to basically create more room. So not pay these bills so we can pay those bills. And they believe that she can keep the government running for about five more months, maybe up until June or July. But they have to do some accounting tricks, basically. We no longer have just the, the room on the credit card to pay these bills. And so we need to um, do these extraordinary maneuverings within our accounting to be able to pay these bills and make sure that we don't default on any of our debts. Um, now, if of course, <laughs> because of the midterm elections, the Republicans are now in control of the House. The Democrats are in control of the Senate. And, of course, Joe Biden, a Democrat, is in the, the, the White House. And so uh, Speaker McCarthy has stated that they are not going to raise the debt ceiling until Congress can address um, spending priorities. And basically, they won't re remove the debt ceiling until they can take money out of other largely democratic funded priorities. Um, and the White House has responded by saying passing the debt ceiling is a bipartisan um, uh, job and they refuse to negotiate with the Republicans on that. And on one hand, I completely agree, right? The, the, there, this isn't new spending. This is to pay the bills for the budget Congress has already approved. And so it's not like we're proposing new spending and we want room on the credit card to, to pay for that. We are merely trying to pay the bills Congress has already agreed to pay, or already agreed to, to budget for. Um, now we just have to raise the debt ceiling. And right, so you're here, you're gonna hear a lot of the, the things going on depending on what media outlets you listen to. If you listen to Fox News, they're going to highlight the fact that, you know, the Demo Democrats are refusing to negotiate and this is unprecedented. If you're going to listen to CNN and most other media, you're going to hear the fact that the, the Republicans are trying to renegotiate a budget that's already been agreed on. And they're both going to try to blame each other for the, the fear mongering that the networks are going to be doing over the next few months uh, until something gets passed. Um, and I, again, this is completely, it's political, it's childish, and it demonstrates that the United States of America is absolutely an immature nation, right? Republicans aren't deficit hawks when they're in office, right? Three times they raised the debt ceiling when President Trump was in office, three times. Democrats talk about fiscal responsibility when they're not in office. So the, the, the only time these political parties are fiscally responsible is when they're in the minority, right? Then they're like, oh, we should think about our spending and we should not spend here, we should not spend there. When they're in office, they're just like, oh, we just got to spend all this money anyway and we're just going to do it. And and that's, that's how the two parties operate. Neither party 
is fiscally conservative. And if you're a Republican and you think your party is fiscally conservative, please stop watching Fox News because um, your party is not fiscally conservative. They are free spending and put a lot of money into their priorities. Um, so they're only conservative. Anyway, let's not get into the politics of it. Neither side is fiscally conservative. Um, and both sides have no problem increasing the debt ceiling when they're in the majority. Um, and both sides are adamant about obstructing. So this is all just politics. And it's a dangerous game because we're literally playing with not only the economy of our own nation, but we're playing with the global economy here. Um, and that's it just demonstrates the absolute immaturity of our nation. And that as a, as a country, we got way too much power, way too much wealth, and way too many weapons way too early before we have the maturity as a part of a global community to know how to wield these things. And so you now have children playing politics with the global economy. But that, so that's what's going on. My personal belief is that when we pass a budget, that budget should come with the automatic raising of the debt ceiling to pay for that budget. It's that simple. We don't need to have this same fight twice, right? Let's have the fight when we propose the budget and approve the budget. Once we approve the budget, then let's also agree we're going to pay for it. There's no point in approving the budget if you don't approve paying for it. So again, children, not you, but Congress, my congressional children, if you're going to pass a budget, have the integrity to agree to pay for it. If you don't have the integrity, if you want to play politics, leave office, please. You're not doing your constituents, your nation, or even the globe any good whatsoever. So let's just take some responsible thinking about this. Anyway, that's my take on it. Um, I want to share this. I found this on PolitiFact today. Again, depending if you listen to CNN or Fox News, in which... Um, news uh, bubble you live in, you're going to be told how the other side is to blame. And they did some fact checking on Biden's claim that ra rising, raising the debt ceiling is usually bipartisan. And by and large, it usually is. So the, they found that this was a half truth told by, by Biden. The primary uh, word in his, uh, in his statement was usually. Um, and they pointed out, and I think the Republicans have pointed out that twice, once in 2006 and again in 2004, when Joe Biden was in the Senate, he voted against raising the debt ceiling for Republican budgets. And so, again, this just demonstrates the childlike nature of our two-party system. Right, where Joe Biden is happy to demonstrate his fiscal conservativeness when he's in the minority and not in power, and we need to obstruct the Republicans. But when he's president and he has an agenda and a budget he wants to pass and money he wants to spend, then suddenly, oh, this is a bipartisan issue and we need to. And again, neither side has the integrity to blame the other, right? This is just the way they work. It's childish, it's immature. Um, and so, yeah, so Joe Biden's, uh, for all the ranting you're going to hear, Republicans and Joe Biden and his press secretary being adamant that this is a bipartisan issue and we should not deal with this, we should not have this fight every four years or every two years, they're going to ignore the fact that Joe Biden voted against raising the debt ceiling. Yeah, to my relatives. Apologize for that. I'm still here on Thursday, uh, January 19, trying to finish my second cup of coffee, but uh, there was a brief internet outage in my area. 
and it was just a local outage. Um, didn't last real long, but it was long enough to disrupt my stream, and uh, I didn't have a chance to conclude what I was talking about. So I went back and looked at how far, at what point it did cut off, and I was just wrapping up the discussion on the debt ceiling. And so, I, yeah, I was pretty much done with that section when the previous video stopped. So I thought, well, I didn't get to say goodbye and I had some more stuff I wanted to talk about. So I thought I would come back on now and talk a little bit more about the unmarked graves and the issues going on there. So if you're still here, I welcome you to pull up your second cup of coffee and let's finish this cup together and then we can get about our day. But uh, if you follow me um, regularly, last week I mentioned that uh, uh, Governor Hochul from from New York, the New York State Legislature last year passed for the very first time a bill protecting unmarked graves. The tribes in that country, in that state, have been trying for a long time to get a bill uh, to protect unmarked graves. And it finally passed the legislature and it went to the governor's desk uh, for her signature and she vetoed it. And uh, there's been a fair number of articles written about this, especially in native news websites. I actually found this one on Yahoo News of all site for you millennials out there yahoo um or even you gen z's out there if you're listening yahoo is one of the original um large internet companies they had the original search engine and they had uh uh kind of an online portal similar to google but not with near as much stuff and they very much kind of lost their way over the past few years but they still have some very good news sites and so yahoo news is a fairly popular news site still and yahoo sports is still a very good space and there's still some people i know who still use yahoo mail but anyway so on the yahoo site they have an article um on the unmarked graves i'm i just put that into the comments i'm going to share that here really quick um, but if you look at this website, it actually goes through a lot of the history. It talks about what happened in the past and how this bill came together. They give the background of this bill, which is really important. And then they talked about um, the offending clause. And so one of the statements that Governor Hochul made when she vetoed this bill is that it didn't go far enough to protect uh, property owners. This is the statement she said here. Governor Hochul vetoed the bill on December 30 because it fails to balance the right of property owners with the interests of families of lineal descent and other groups, she wrote in her veto memo. Um, and so they address that in this story when they talk about the offending clause, which is right here, this section. And I want to read this for you. So, uh, uh, the Ankichung Nation Chief Harry Wallace, um, who's been working with the, getting this bill passed and lobbying for it, um, he spoke with Native News Online, which they quote in here, and he said that the governor's proposal to amend the law negates the entire purpose of the law. And this is his quote. He said, we thought the bill was a strong bill until they added the offending clause that said, if the property owners, and that's euphemism, euphemism for developer, that if nothing has been done within 60 days, the property owner can remove the bodies himself. He said, you negate the entire process by waiting out 60 days. Nothing happens within 60 days. They can't even get a permit within 60 days, but they can remove bodies within 60 days. And so, again, her proposal was to amend this and say, give them a 60-day window. And the Native Nations came back and said, that is not long enough because it then just allows the, the property owner, the developer, to move forward, even though if nothing happens within those 60 days. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, outcry among the Native Nations. And uh, Native News Online published this story, and I'm going to put this into the chat as well, that uh, the Seneca Nation has now passed a resolution basically condemning or denouncing uh, the, the veto of this bill. Um, and so they now have 
gone on the official record of saying this was a very bad move by the state of New York and by Governor Hochul. And in the article in Yahoo, it actually points out that a lot of her campaign contributions came from real estate developers um, and that she raised a lot of money uh, during her campaign from real estate developers. And so it's uh, not surprising then that she chose to side with developers over the rights of Native peoples and Native nations. So anyway, that's just another story that's going on within Indian country right now. And I wanted just to make people aware of that. Um, but uh, yeah, so this this is a few things going on this week. A few stories that I'm watching. And uh, I want to thank all of you for joining me for my second cup of coffee. I'm sorry for the disruption that took place and the, the, the bit of a of a break we had in the live stream. So hopefully this will let us come to some sort of conclusion a little bit. Um, I want to share that this afternoon, actually at four o'clock Eastern time, um, on my Patreon site, and I started my Patreon site almost a year ago. Um, it was in February of 2022. And I did it as a way to have some more in-depth engagement with people who are interested in my work. And there's several tiers on my Patreon. It's a subscription service. One of the top tiers is called my On Selling Truths tier. And almost every month for the past 10 or 11 months, uh, my co-author and myself, Sing Chan Ra, have been doing a live stream um, on my Patreon, going through a, the book study, chapter by chapter of On Selling Truths. And we're going to be doing chapter 11 today. We did chapter 10 last month, and we're going to be doing chapter 11 today at 4 o'clock Eastern time, 1 o'clock Pacific time. And uh, we're looking at, this is the chapter on trauma. And so after dealing with the genocide and the history and even the, the uh, dehumanizing genocidal legacy of Abraham Lincoln, now we're going to look at the trauma that this inflicts, not only on people of color, but on the perpetrators um, through what, what I call a multi-generational communal manifestation of um, a complex perpetration-induced traumatic stress. So we'll be discussing that today in our study. If you'd like to join that, you can subscribe to my Patreon. The great thing about my Patreon, especially if you join it now, is uh, you not only get access to the live stream today, but you get access to the whole year's worth of content prior to that. And so if you subscribe to the On Selling Truths tier, you can actually go back and watch all the previous chapters that Sing Chan and I did. I'm going to be making some changes to my Patreon this month, and I'm really looking forward to kind of grow my Patreon over the next year as I, I've, I've been pondering some ways that we can use that platform to continue to increase the engagement with uh, this content. But anyway, that's going to be going on there, and I welcome you to join me on that. Um, also, I'm continuing to, to just promote the book and talk about Unselling Truths. And so if you would, if you have not ordered a signed copy of Unselling Truths, you can do that um, from my website. Um, but anyway, it's really good to talk with all of you here. I hope you're having a great day. I hope your second cup of coffee is as good as mine is. And uh, thank you for joining my relatives. Walk in beauty. And may we all learn how to walk in beauty together. And hakonet.